For those of you who are not familiar with uh, the Des Moines Area Religious Council, we are an interfaith organization that has been in existence since 1952. So we've been around for a very long time. Uh, originally, some of you may not know, originally we were only Protestant. So not only only Christian, but only Protestant. And within a few years, we added the Catholic community. And then in the 1970s, um, Des Moines did what was, I think, a very progressive thing at that point, And that was that we became interfaith. So we now have the three Jewish congregations as our members, as well as a Muslim congregation and the Unitarian congregation. So we are very interfaith and we feel very fortunate to be able to uh, carry on this interfaith dialogue in Des Moines and in Polk County and in Iowa. It's not every group that is interfaith and uh, we do events like this, but we also do, for those of you who don't know, uh, we do the food pantry network for Greater Des Moines and Polk County. Um, my little button today is vote to end hunger. So uh, we had an event earlier today at the Hunger Summit about voting to end hunger. Many years ago, um, in the 70s, members of the Jewish community in Des Moines stepped up to help become an interfaith community and to help DMARC specifically become an interfaith organization. And David Baer was one of those people who stepped up and became very important to DMARC. Um, I don't know how many of you knew David Baer. I know there are some of you in the audience who knew David, a truly wonderful man. I only had the chance to know him for the last few years of his life. Um, some of you will know he was an engineer and a businessman in Des Moines and deeply devoted actually to DMARC. He was the president of our foundation. And uh, Linda, you were actually a member of the foundation in the early years too. He gave us the first thousand dollar gift when the foundation first started. So very important to DMARC and to its success and its ability to sustain itself and its work. And this lectureship, uh, this is the fifth year, and this was donated by the family in honor of David and his contributions to DMARC. And we are so grateful to the Bear family uh, for this opportunity to have this kind of interfaith conversation in Des Moines and to actually hear speakers from around the country and actually around the world talk about uh, different aspects of our interfaith life together. So we are blessed tonight to have Professor Yaakov Ariel from uh, UNC Chapel Hill. And he is originally from Jerusalem and so uh, made his way to the United States to the University of Chicago of all things to study and ended up in Chapel Hill, which I think of as, as a sort of extraordinary uh, travels for someone from Jerusalem. And he is here tonight to talk with us about the relationship between evangelical Christianity and Judaism, which is one of his areas of expertise and interest. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ariel. Thank you very, very much. Yes, you have to turn off your cell phone too. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> The last time I gave a talk, my granddaughter had a butt call, uh, forgive me for using the term, and uh, I was really in a, in a terrible dilemma. Should I not answer my granddaughter? <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. This is uh, wonderful to see your people of different uh, persuasions, different backgrounds coming to this evening. Uh, there's always the fear that I'll have to talk to the chairs <laughs> instead of uh, to a live audience. And I very much hope that this will turn into a conversation, that I'll hear remarks, questions, challenges, opinions, uh, pieces of information that will enrich my work and my knowledge. Uh, so don't, don't, be sh don't be too Iowan uh, polite <laughs> and be a little bit New Yorker about it. So the topic here is, uh, I bring this picture not in order to criticize here the people you see, 
but in order to tell you that this is just the tip of the iceberg. What we see here is something, you recognize the two people, I'm sure. One of them is the Prime Minister of Israel, the other one is quite the well-known Texan evangelist, John Hagee, who in the last half a decade is probably the most outspoken, most known, um, most active or most in the limelight supporter of Israel on behalf of evangelical uh, faith, if you will. And you can see he looks here like uh, the kind of rich uncle who you, you would have wished visited you when you were in college, bringing a nice check, and that's exactly what he's doing, incidentally, uh, among other things. And we see Israel, Israel's prime minister, who being a politician through and through, we don't see his face, but we see his smiles, uh, is of course uh, happy to receive this visit from Uncle John. But uh, there's more to it than that, because those two people also happen to be, if you will, Republicans. Those people tend to agree with each other's politics, even beyond faith and messianic ideas or beliefs. But now I'm going to tell you, you see this picture? You see the tip of the iceberg? Everybody knows about the special attitude of conservative evangelicals or many conservative evangelicals towards Israel, towards the Jewish people, towards the hope, uh, the, the, the role of Israel within the hope for uh, the return of Jesus to earth. Everybody knows about the biblical reading of conservative evangelicals, which tend to be more literary, although some liberal Christians might question that. Uh, but what people don't always know is that the relationship between evangelical Christians and Jews is already uh, an old story that goes back all the way to its roots goes all the way to the Reformation of the 16th century, and its actual encounter starts in the 18th century. And I'll show that uh, soon. Perhaps we can go even back to the 17th century, the rise of the Pietist movement in Germany, and certainly the rise of evangelicalism in the English-speaking world in the 18th century, and that the story of evangelical Jewish encounter is not just about politics. Politics is actually a small part of it. It's about biblical exegesis. It's about an enormous body, an ocean of literature produced by Pietists and evangelicals about Jews, for Jews, for the Protestant communities, for the Jews, uh, sharing their opinions on the Jews with the Jews because the Jews don't know what their role in history really is. And, if, and, and the Protestant community doesn't really know what the role of Jews in history really is, because this is only a segment of Protestantism. And that throughout the ages, if you will, throughout the generations, evangelicals were the most active, Pietist and evangelicals were the most active, almost exclusively the activists of approaching the Jews uh, re reaching to the Jews as far as faith goes, sharing with the Jews, quote unquote, their faith, their opinions, producing literature I mentioned, teaching their own people, teaching Jews, and investing hopes and resources in the idea of the Jewish return to Palestine before the Jewish Zionist movement even came on the scene. So this has a long history. I won't, I won't go here into a four-year cor course on the history of evangelical Jewish encounter, but I will mention a few highlights. And I'd like to show that this is not just, it's one of the outcomes. What we see is one of the outcomes, but not necessarily its more, most major. Moreover, this, this gentleman on the right, John Hagee, the founder and head of Kufi, Christian, Christians United for Israel, is just one leader among a number of leaders, and his group is only one group among many. In fact, you'd be surprised it's not the largest group 
or the group that uh, collects and spends most, the, most, the, the largest amount of money relating to and investing in the Jews. There are other such groups, some of them more, more veteran and more prominent. Okay, so here I promise to go back, back in time to the 18th century. In uh, the late 17th century, pietism comes on the scene in Germany, a Lutheran environment, but there's like the Puritans, there are pietists inside the church and outside the church, uh, but the first Protestant systematic mission in general, or I would say global mission, started in Halle, Germany, by, the, by a group of pietists in the late 17th century who took a different view than mainstream Lutheranism of the time, took a different view of what we can say is mainstream Christianity, Catholics or Protestants, and viewed the Jews, the living, breathing Jews around them. They were not the first. They started in the 16th century, first among the radical reformers, the left wing of the Reformation. Then it started among some reformed Protestant Christians. One of the very early one was no other than John Calvin, who viewed the Jews as a people who are not eternally cast out, as a people who are, in principle, the heirs and continuers of biblical Israel, and as a people who can renew their covenant with God. Within the Lutheran tradition, this idea was rejected in the 16th century and 17th century and among major Lutheran groups until after World War II. But a group of pietists, pietist is, uh, I would say, something like born again, if you will, Lutherans of the 17th and 18th century and later on 19th and 20th, people who read the Bible more literally, people who are messianically oriented, also oriented towards the idea of conversion, regeneration. Those people have decided, while being within the Lutheran world, to accept a reformed attitude and to say the Jews are still there, they're still the children of Israel. They have a mission in history which is alongside the church, but not identical to that of the church. They have a role and mission in history even if they do not convert. Which then brings the million dollar question. So why are they, and Pietist and Evangelical ever since, so invested in missionizing the Jews? If they want a Jewish people to remain alongside the church and not within it. Jews converting shows that the Jews can understand and accept the gospel, the sign. It's a blessed sign. It's a hopeful sign. Jews who convert assure their eternal salvation. The idea is actually that you don't convert the entire Jewish people in this generation. You convert only a few symbolic individuals. And the major aim of missions to the Jews was not to convert the Jewish people, as certainly not en masse. The idea is has been, was, to connect with the Jews, to educate the Jews as to their role and mission in history, to assure that the Jews are waiting for the Messiah, that they understand their own sacred texts in the right way. This shows us what I would call the dialectical complex attitude of pietists and evangelicals towards Jews, or on the one hand, Jesus' brothers and sisters, uh, God's first nation. I'm quoting phrases, uh, heirs to the covenant, a people who, should be, who shall be renewed in a day, in the fullness of time. But at the same time, those people, and here there is a sharing of traditional Christian attitudes, live in 
spiritual blindness. They don't understand their own scriptures fully. They have a great potential, but they have their limitations. And their faith, their Jewish faith and practices per se, will not assure their salvation. They will not even assure, they will not even provide them with a moral spiritual, with a moral campus and spiritual direction. This incidentally I'm saying in very general terms because we will see more subtleties and more opinions and we'll see that those things are going to change. Evangelical relations to the Jews and be buried and dynamic. What do we see here? At first glance, rabbinical texts. Early 18th century rabbinical texts. It's called Or Le'et Erev. Light, listen to that, light towards darkness. Light at the time of dawn. Um, and if you read it, this is written both in Hebrew and in part of it is written in what is known as Rashi scripture. This looks almost like a rabbinical text. But if you read it, and if you read it, even sign the date and the name of the writer is even signed as if it's a rabbi signing a Jewish text. But if you read it more carefully, it's a pietist Lutheran text of the early 18th century that tries to tell the Jews that, you know, there is hope in the time of darkness and where that hope really lies. And uh, it's a text for the Jews which uses rabbinical appearance and rabbinical authority to convince the Jews in the truth of the gospel, or rather in the truth of the gospel, messianically oriented towards the arrival of Jesus, as pietists understand it. It's those texts, I, I, I'm absolutely crazy about those texts. <laughs> Let's jump another century from the 18th century to the 19th century, and I'm really sweeping through history, and I hope your questions will bring me back to various aspects which I do not discuss. Already spoke about complex attitudes. Here we have the tombstone of a very special person. He actually combines both German pietism and English evangelicalism. It's a German, British, South African uh, who worked for English diplomacy, British diplomacy, and worked as an educator uh, for the pietist. Uh, the pietist uh, Duke, Grand Duke of Baden, educating his children, so he was like a court preacher, a court, court educator, and as such had good connections with both the British elite and German elite. This gentleman wrote books, exegetical books, about uh, the Bible and the return of the Jews to Zion before the Zionist movement came on the scene. But then the Zionist movement did come on, on the scene. In 1895, Theodor Herzl published his Judenstadt, his Jewish state, as a program for establishing a European-style, European, European character, uh, German-speaking Jewish state in Palestine, which he saw as a progressive, liberal, democratic, German-speaking, uh, Bildung-oriented, educated state. And he receives help from a whole group of pietist and evangelical uh, leaders. This is one of the unknown histories of Zionism. Most Jews who wrote about uh, the history of Zionism neglected the Christian support. Most uh, Christians who wrote about Zionism until lately, until, until pointing to contemporary evangelical support, neglected the Christian support. But in some ways you can see the early stages of Zionism of receiving enormous help, not just advice and connections, but also moral support, Christian supporters. And among the supporters were first-rate personalities, the reform-oriented uh, founder of the Red Cross, Henri Dunant, uh, a, a number of American evangelicals, 
reached the first Zionist Congress and the second Zionist Congress reporting to their readers. Uh, but this gentleman is really special because he became, in effect, the confidant and the advisor of Herzl. Herzl at that time thought first in German terms than in British terms, and he wanted German, Germ the German government, the Germ German emperor, to take the Zionist movement under his wing. How do you reach the German emperor, Wilhelm II, who was not easily approachable, who was not necessarily a congenial, he wasn't from Iowa. And, um, but Heschler was a little bit from Iowa, and uh, he persuaded the Grand Duke of Baden, who was the uncle of the emperor, to, in favor of, of political Zionism, and the Grand Duke started to organize, a, a, to connect between Herzl and uh, the emperor. When that fell, incidentally, Herzl moved to a British-oriented uh, policy, also connecting with pietists and evangelicals. Here we have Heschler, a French-speaking reform minister, wrote a book about Herzl and Heschler, and he called it the prophet and the prince. Prophet being Heschler, the prince being Herzl. But it's very interesting to see the relationship from the beginning. Herzl didn't understand beans about, uh, forgive me, about pietist theology. Uh, he could tell a Protestant from a Catholic, but that was about it. I don't think he ever met a Methodist in his life. I ask forgiveness from all people of Iowa. Uh, but he saw that Heschler is keenly a friend, keenly a supporter, and that he is a decent and well-meaning person. On, and and we, have, we have things that each person wrote about the other. And Heschler, in his uh, part, said, you know, Herzl, what a terrific character, what a terrific human being, which is something you'll find in relation to Jews among evangelicals but he doesn't understand what he's really doing. What he's doing is way beyond his program of assuring, a secure, securing the physical well-being of the Jewish people. That's not the aim of Jewish return to Palestine. The aim is totally different. Okay, so we have your second early proponent of evangelical proponent of Zionism of the same generation of Heschler, except that he had more luck and lived for 95 years, which for someone born in 1840 was unusual. Nowadays, in Iowa, people take it for granted, but uh, that wasn't the case uh, 180 years ago. William Blackstone. There's now a renewed interest in William Blackstone. Um, Boyola University uh, just opened a Blackstone room so there's, there's a renewed interest in evangelical, conservative evangelical circles in Blackstone. Blackstone was selling agricultural insurance in Illinois in the 1860s, 1870s, one of the early settlers uh, of Chicago. And by the sort of late 1860s, early 1870s, he was converted to the idea of the imminent return of Jesus to earth. Now, for some of you, this might be an understandable, run-of-the-mill idea. For many Christians, it's not self-understood. For many Christian groups, the idea is that Jesus might return and the kingdom of, them, of God on earth might be ushered in, but in some remote theoretical future. That's the way mainstream Christianity has looked upon this idea since the 5th century. We get this idea more among the, what you call the left wing of Protestantism. But here we have someone from Chicago, from the commercial elite. In fact, he was not the only one. The entire Protestant commercial elite of Chicago in his time was converted. Among them, other, other people such as Orestius Pafford, a lawyer and a Presbyterian lay leader. Uh, Marshall Fields. Those of you who are veterans and knew Chicago in its days of glory, which means when I was young, uh, 
know that Marshall Fields used to be the department store of Chicago, and nowadays uh, things glory has gone away, and it's now Macy's. Not that I have anything against Macy's, for in case there are fans in the audience. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, so those people were promoting the idea of the imminent return of Jesus. The central figure in the group was Dwight Moody, the most uh, active evangelist in America in the second part of the 19th century, whose hub was in Chicago. He uh, was a shoe salesman, excuse me, not salesman in the, in the regular, but a, a, a businessman who used his business skills to professionalize and systematize evangelistic campaigns and turn them into an urban phenomenon. He's also the founding of what became the Moody Bible Institute and many other groups. Blackstone became an evangelist and a proponent of the idea of the second coming. Those people followed, particularly after the Civil War, in the footsteps of an Irish, English, I hope I'm not throwing too many names or ideas, uh, by the name, anyhow, but the, the name of the gentleman they followed was John Darby, who moved the idea of the second coming, the Messianic Protestant hope, from its Adventist-oriented stage, which predicted exact dates and calculated dates, <coughs> to the idea that it's going to happen soon, it's going to happen, it's going to happen soon. We're towards the end of the penultimate era in human history, but we don't know exactly when. This is known as dispensationalism coming from the idea of eras, ages, for each of which God has a different plan for humanity. Three categories of humanity, the non-converted, the truly faithful, the true believers have undergone experiences of conversion, and the unconverted Jews. The Jews are not a regular people. Evangel Protestant evangelicals were committed to evangelism everywhere, in Africa, in the Caribbeans, in India, in China. They sent thousands of missionaries in the 19th century to all corners of the earth. But they never, and, and people had vocations, sometimes the training families, Korea, Japan, China, India, uh, South Af the south parts of Africa, the Sahara, the, all kinds of places. But the Jews are not just quote unquote Korean or Japanese or Nigerians, or for that matter, Swedish or Dutch, so there isn't an issue here of race. The Jews have a, are a special people with a special role and mission in history. And the good Jews are those who realize it. I hope all Jews here are waking up. The, the good Jews are just, just those who realize it, and I don't want to sound unrespectful, but Blackstone, among a whole other group of people, didn't, how should I put it politely, he wasn't fully enthusiastic about reformed Jews because his understanding was they are, not become, they are not any more traditional Jews yearning for the arrival of the Messiah. They did not become Christians, which would have been another good option. <laughs> Instead, they have joined, forgive me, for, they have joined the modernists. They follow in the line, they're parallel, to Christian Protestant modernists. And those people are reacting, those people are the early fundamentalist, conservative, post-civil war, if the evangelical camp is divided, and the conservative part, those who would not become modernists, are becoming fundamentalists, as they were known, as they would be known from the 1920s to roughly the 1950s. Incidentally, today, the term fundamentalist is mostly passé. Don't, try, don't use it, it's not politically correct. But Blackstone is really not enthusiastic about the kind of rabbis he meets in Chicago. He's meeting there uh, people such as Rabbi Emil G. Hirsch, 
the legendary rabbi of Sinai congregation in Chicago, which meets on Sunday morning, and which tells you that the Messianic age will be the age of reform. We're reforming the earth, as did liberal Protestants. We're reforming the earth through technological advancement, through political, uh, political, through political means, through education, a big word. Uh, through evangelism, but not the kind of evangelism that asks people to be born again in Christ, to convert and accept Jesus. And he sees those Jews who believe in progress, who believe in creating a society that is beyond just a Jew and a Christian. The Jew believe that this means that the entire humanity will, in essence, become Jewish. Liberal Christians believe that it means that the entire humanity will become, in essence, liberal Protestant. But the Blackstones of this world are meeting those people and are totally unenthusiastic. The Jews need to remain the Jews in the way Christians understood them, have this post-biblical, rabbinical faith as, that isn't Christian but is still yearning towards return <coughs> to and their ancestral land and their rebuilding of the temple. We're skipping again, moving forward, but still to Presbyterians. This is, this is an homage here <laughs> for Reverend Sarai Rice the, uh, the, and other, other Presbyterians. I mean, you see, I'm, we're treating you with respect, bringing Presbyterians all over the place. Uh, here we are with Philip Larkin. You need to be a Presbyterian engineer to build this map. This is one of many maps he created. It's called Rightly Dividing the World of Truth. The Word of Truth. It shows you history. What does this mean? This is history. This is history from creation, from Genesis, all the way to, to the Last Judgment. And if you look at it, you cannot actually, this, this is not a very well focused picture, but there are Jews and Christians are separated in, their, in the plans of God for humanity. The important thing for us is that we now live in the time of the Gentiles. Since the Jews refused to accept Jesus during his first coming, history was suspended. History stands still. What we see around us is just, is just uh, standing still from, from the history of salvation point of view. The church is here. It's the time of the church, time of the Gentiles. The Jews are cast out temporarily from the scene of history, but they're going to come back. We are here toward the very, very end of the current era, which will end with the secret any moment, I'm quoting, rapture of the saints, the fetching from earth, the snatching from earth of the true Christian believers, those who were converted, leaving behind the Jews and unconverted non-Jews. Then comes a period of seven years. I'm not saying that all evangelicals support this uh, scenario, but those evangelical Christians since the late 19th century are messianically oriented, that's the scenario most of them support. What is known as, to, this will sound almost like pharmacology, but it's not, it's, it's a, there's a formula, uh, pre-tribulationist dispensational premillennialism. And if you can repeat that, you'll get an A. <laughs> this ends seven years later with the return of Jesus and his saints, the truly converted to earth, to defeat Antichrist, in, he will come to the Olivet, the Mount of Olive. Uh, he will defeat Antichrist. He will, est he will establish the temple, although we'll see variations on that. And actually, those Jews who convert during those seven years, about a third, two-thirds of humanity will perish, a third will become loyal to Jesus. Jews will recognize the preachings they've heard from missionaries, and from Christian friends, and will realize what happened. 
If you evangelize Jews systematically, if you spread the word, if you tell the people what to expect, they will recognize the events, even if they didn't accept Jesus beforehand, they will accept him after the rapture. In fact, 144,000 Jews, 12 from each tribe, very few Jews know from which tribe they come, uh, will become instantly evangelists for those people left behind on earth. I won't go into, I can go into more details. So people ask me, so what about those snatched? They will stay with Jesus uh, in, in what you could call a heavenly summer camp until they return. Uh, it's, it's worthwhile converting. It's worthwhile converting for that and staying on earth, which will witness the worst period in its history, both physically, as far as climate change goes, for example. This has been predicted by uh, conservative evangelicals for ages now. So we're living, might have started, uh, but also socially, social revolts, wars, uh, social strife, etc. I'm really jumping in history and reaching here the 1950s, 60s, pre-1967. Evangelicals were supportive of the idea of a Jewish state. They were support. They celebrated the Balfour Declaration of 1917. Some evangelical Christians were instrumental in securing that declaration. I hope everybody knows it's the declaration which Britain declared in 1917, uh, Lord Balfour, that the England will secure a Jewish homeland, a Jewish commonwealth in Palestine. Evangelicals were on the Jewish side in the interwar period, in it, their, their, and marveled, marveled at Jewish immigration to Palestine, at the settlement of uh, the building of dozens and dozens of agricultural villages, of the rejuvenation of the Hebrew language, of the founding of the Hebrew University in 1925, of the founding of the seaport in Haifa in 1930, and so on and so forth. And if you open evangelical journals, you will see during those years, including Sunday school uh, journals, including church journals, uh, including journals of uh, evangelical schools of higher learning, what we call today the Moody Monthly, used to be called the King's Business, uh, you will see that evangelicals are not just supporting Zionism, but they are deriving from Zionism something enormous and from the Jewish resettlement of Palestine. This is served, this is, this serves as a proof that evangelicals read the scriptures correctly, understood it correctly, and that history is unfolding in front of their eyes. Then 1948, there is a war in Palestine, the, the country is divided, and the Jews established on the 15th of May 1948, uh, political entity, a recognized state that is recognized by most nations. Evangelicals are pointing to Israel saying, we told you so. But they're also at the same time marveling themselves, ha, so this is happening. John Walford was not just anybody. He was, for decades, the president of Dallas Theological Seminary. Many people think mistakenly that it's a Baptist school, it's actually an interdenominational school, but it's really the West Point of conservative, one of the West Points of conservative evangelicalism. Thousands of ministers studied there. Hundreds of writers, professors, interpreters studied there. He's going to Israel in the early 1960s and he's reporting some things he doesn't like. He doesn't like the secular culture of the state. He doesn't like the self-assurance of the first generation of the country that, wow, we've managed on our own, the few against the many, to build here a successful or 
on its way to be successful commonwealth. The country was still small, poor, economically frail, uh, militarily frail, because he thinks that, of course, this is not the making of what you would call secular humanism. This is divine intervention. And that the Israeli secularists, not only that they don't understand history, but they, they, they're really in between. They're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not observant and they're not Christian. At the same time, incidentally, many evangelical Christians did not at that time like the Orthodox community in Palestine and then Israel because it was so hostile to missionary presence and to evangelical interaction. But John Velvet, on the whole, sum, sum, summarizes his visit. He was also in Jordan, so Palestinian uh, refugees. He made the claim that the land of Israel is big enough, rich enough, to sustain Arabs and Jews. There should be a state of Israel, but the Israelis are obliged to treat the Palestinians fairly, which is uh, something to remember. Because we have to be truthful about what people write. This is not the attitude of Hal Lindsey, incidentally. So I'm jumping, I'm jumping forward. And each time I'm showing you what evangelicals think, I'm not showing so much development on the Jewish side. I'll try to do that a little bit. This book is from 1970. If you want to write a bestseller and really that will sell tens of millions of copies, you have a choice. Either write the second kind of Harry Potter, it sold tens of millions of copies, of copies and earned its author more than a billion dollars, or write an evangelical bestseller. If you write something of how to be a nice person or how to find the perfect spouse, this was done before, and the audience is more limited. The late great planet Earth. Hal Lindsey, a campus minister, uh, writes what he thought would be more something uh, more limited, but it became an international bestseller. He writes in the wake of a six-day war. No event in uh, history has steered pietist and evangelical messianic imagination as much since the French Revolution. French Revolution steered their messianic uh, imagination enormously and was a proof that something enormous is changing towards the end of an era. But Lindsay writes a book at the height of evangelical enthusiasm over the Six Day War. We should explain something about this war. It happened to those of you who were old enough to remember, I was there, 1967. Before the war took place. The attention started at the middle of May, 1967. Israelis and Jews around the world and people caring about the state of Israel were certain that Israel is about to fight a second 1948 war, that Arab armies will invade Israel, that there will be a fighting from home to home. I can tell you that because I lived on the border between Israel and Jordan at that time. People were preparing, stocking not only food, because Jerusalem was under siege in 1948 for a long month, in the summer, and there wasn't even water. There was rationing of water. Uh, no water for, for washing or cleaning, but rationing of drinking water. People started stock, to stock water, including in my own home. The, this war of six days in which Israel managed, I don't know if I can use in a sanctuary, in a synagogue, in Iowa, the term beat the shit out of uh, Arab My armies. Can. What's that? My sanctuary sure can. Okay. <laughs> Amazed everybody, the Arabs, the Jews, the Israeli soldiers, everybody was in awe. Everybody, this was a messianic moment for Israelis. This was a messianic moment for evangelical Christians. But there was something else we should not forget. This is not all about messianism and biblical faith. We are at the height of the Cold War. A person who was amazed and completely changed, uh, completely uh, transformed, melted like, like butter, 
was Lyndon Johnson, President of the United States. He was, he, here he was stuck in Vietnam in a war that doesn't end, tens of thousands of soldiers dying, billions and billions of dollars gone, and the Israelis with American arms, American airplanes, also French, and some British uh, tanks, managed to beat three, one army that was uh, uh, Western-oriented, the Jordanian, but three armies that were Soviet-backed, the Egyptians, the Syrians, and the Iraqis. Almost a miracle, and, and in an elegant, quick way. This was an elevating moment for Jews. For many Jews, this was also, people forget that, uh, validation of their hopes in Israel, of the, their hopes that Israel will survive and will be indeed a haven for the Jewish people. For Israelis, this was a proof of their righteousness. For evangelical re Christians, more than 48, this was a proof that Israel was born for a reason and is indeed to play a role in history, is indeed playing a role in history. But it was also evangelical Christians and not Jehovah's Witnesses. They're not countercultural in the sense that they oppose the American Commonwealth. Evangelical Christians have always amalgamated American patriotism and a sense that America, with all its faults, and they count those faults, or what consider to be those faults, that America, with all its faults, is a better nation than other nations, and has also a role in history. And one of them is to secure the well-being of Israel. This book, if you want to go back 45 years in time, this book is really a Cold War saga and an evangelical messianic manifesto. He bashes at the Soviets. He bashes at the Chinese. He doesn't mention the, the Muslims. He would write 40 years later, 35 years later, a book about Islam in the wake of September 11. But at that moment, he speaks about the Arabs, and for him, the Arabs are just the clients of the Soviets. And they should have. They deserve what they get. Snyder 67, just a few days after the war, and Billy Graham's own father-in-law is writing an editorial for Christianity Today, Time to Rebuild, question mark. And now we have a book here, Ready to Rebuild, which is in some ways an answer to the question mark. Rebuild the temple. The Jews, one of the most amazing things, one of the most hopeful moments, the Jews, because until 67, the Jews were not holding really the historical parts of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the capital of Israel, not recognized by anyone except Israel. All embassies remained in Tel Aviv, but because in the UN resolution, Dividing Palestine, Jerusalem was supposed to be an international city under UN control. But even West Jerusalem, the Jerusalem I grew up in as a child, was West Jerusalem. It was outside the historical limits of Jerusalem. It was the Western, Israel developed those areas, but this was the Western suburbs that were not even part of Jerusalem until the, early, until the late 19th century. Now, Israel held the most crucial landscapes of all. The Mount of Olives, well, the Messiah is going to arrive there anyhow, and the Temple Mount. Are the Israelis going to read evangelical, let's call it, uh, how-to-do manuals and know that they are supposed to build a temple, but it wasn't yet supposed to be the temple. It's in many ways Antichrist temple. Because the Jews, being ignorant as to their history, not having the right guidance, being on the whole good people, but naive because they're not spiritually uh, in the right place, are going to let themselves be ruled by Antichrist. And Antichrist is going to build a temple, but this is not going to be the right temple. Let's see, it's because Antichrist is going to build a temple. Jews are going to build a temple based on the idea that you need to sacrifice. And we know that since Jesus' arrival, the ultimate sacrifice was made. Incidentally, those people 
stuff that way and then change their minds as they become friends with Jews, Orthodox Jews who want to rebuild the temple, they decide that the Jewish temple can become eventually Jesus' temple. I think you know this gentleman too, although he is a little bit a passé, a little bit uh, out of the uh, limelight lately. He's not John Hagee, and he's also not running for president anymore. And, but he, he is here, dressed like an old-time kibbutznik, an old-time kibbutz member, and um, with the flag of Israel. Today, 2015, the men, they are st in the last decade, you can find among the messianically oriented conservative evangelicals who are not by any means the entire evangelical camp or even its majority today, you can find many people who embrace Israel sometimes more warmly than many uh, critics of Israel in the Jewish camp. And I think it's also many of the, many of, this is a case not just of evangelical, this is evangelical charismatic support for Israel. Charismatic being a movement that came about in the 1970s mostly. Not only American evangelicals are invested in Israel on behalf of a biblical faith and what we can call a conservative uh, worldview. Here we have a book by Jan Willem van der Woven the founder of the Christian Embassy in Jerusalem, a group much larger and more veteran than Kufi, than Christian United for Israel. Van der Hoeven uh, does relate to the Muslim presence on the Temple Mount, which he sees as an abomination. Would-be temple builders very often think that it's not just that the Jews need to build the temple, that Islam needs to be removed from the Temple Mount. It shouldn't be there. It doesn't belong there. It wasn't their, their site to begin with. Uh, some of them do not even recognize Allah to be the, the Abrahamic God. This is one case in point. Uh, Van der Hoeven uh, has been an support, active supporter of Israel now for half a century, uh, but he represents what point of view very similar to that of Hal Lindsey. He incidentally is very critical of Israeli uh, secular culture. He's an end of liberal Jewish views because his understanding is the Jews have so much westernized. This, the Jews have so much become part of the progressive scene and ideas all over the globe that in effect, they will give up on territories, not because they should give up on territories, but because their western civilized, progressive worldview will bring them to do so. They're being in cohorts with the wrong people in uh, Western society. Let's move to a book that really shows you a more updated evangelical attitude of the Jews. This is really 20 years ago, published for the first time, 1995. It's a series between the mid-1990s and the mid-2000s. This is the evangelical Harry Potter, if you will. It sold 60 million copies. Here it says, I think, over 40 million or whatever. I don't know how, I cannot, yeah, over 40 million copies sold. But it sold more than 60 million. If you add children versions, if you add uh, other languages, if you add audio cassettes, and so on and so forth. It also appeared in two movies. How many of you have read Left Behind, incidentally? People read left, read left Behind much more in North Carolina, so I'm afraid Iowa lost the competition. <laughs> Tim LaHaye was, just to introduce the people, Jerry Jenkins, it's easy to introduce, he was an editor at Moody Press. And he is the actual ghost writer, although he's not a ghost writer, he also shared in the revenues. Tim LaHaye, has been now an evangelist for about 60 years. He replaced uh, Jerry Falwell, you know, I'm sure, the he uh, legendary head of Moral Majority. Well, Jerry, uh, Tim LaHaye replaced J 
Jerry Falwell as head of the Moral Majority for a while. I mean, he did many, many, many things. He's certainly on the conservative side of evangelicalism, messianically oriented, uh, biblically oriented. He came with the idea that is now very prevalent in evangelical uh, circles since the 1990s, 1980s it began, 1990s, we see very often that novels and series of novels replaced large, heavy theological tracts. If previously you could sell, or even popular theological tracts, if previously you could sell Jesus is Coming, or you could sell the late great planet Earth, in the 1990s, 2000s, uh, a novel, a series of novels seemed the right thing to disseminate theological ideas. If you didn't read Lift Behind, read it. It's very easy reading. One airplane ride from, which will have to be two, from the Moines to Chapel Hill and you'll complete the novel. Very easy, very simple, and it's full of romance. It's, it's really the most fashionable novel of the turn of 20th century. Romance, intrigue, uh, cheating, um, everything is there. Fancy, fancy, beautiful people. But it takes place, it starts that way, and it continues that way, but quite at the beginning, the rapture takes place. And left behind means most of the people I suspect in this room who will be left behind when the rapture takes place. I know I will be left behind, and I hope a few more people are left behind with me, because otherwise I'll be very lonely. Um, and of course, those who are snatched from earth, good for them. I don't begrudge them. Uh, but he tells us what's going to happen. And also, the idea is, of course, convert now before it happens. You certainly will convert after it happens. It promotes certain, also certain values. It's against abortion. It's uh, for family values, devotion to family, devotion to spouses, to children, all the good stuff. The Jews in Left Behind are amazing people because this time they're good people. There's a gentleman named Rosenzweig. It's really the Jews, as I would say, are seen today. Intelligent, creative. You see a huge development in the way Jews are portrayed. There's still a stereotype, but the stereotype is very different than 18th century or 19th century stereotypes or early 20th century stereotypes. Jews as creative, intelligent people. They all graduated from college. They all went to graduate school. But my goodness, how naive can you get? Those are the people who will follow Antichrist in spite of the fact that they are above average. At the same time, it's the Jews who will supply the evangelist for the, in the period between this era and the next the horrible period of known as the Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. They are the people who will fight Antichrist. And, which is really a homage to the Jews, just as I mentioned that those who work about building the temple are promoting good attitudes of the Jews. There's a homage for the Jews. For the first time in evangelical history, Antichrist is not Jewish. It used to be that when there was an opening, an advertisement for Antichrist wanted, uh, he would be Jewish because Jesus was Jewish. And since Antichrist is an imposter who pretends to be Christ, he had to be Jewish. Not anymore, but there's also not a direct return to Antichrist the Pope, which was the case during the Reformation and throughout the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. They found a terrific solution. Relationship between evangelicals and Catholics improved enormously during the days of Paul, John Paul II. Incidentally, John Paul II is raptured. He's among the righteous. So there's a good relationship with Catholics. There's a good relationship with Jews. The interaction between evangelicals and Jews brought evangelicals and Jews to modify their theological understandings of each other, to warm up to each other. It started as a, between Heschler 
inherits it as what you can call a marriage of convenience. You know, you bring the money, I bring youth and beauty, you bring the money. Here, but, but even marriages of convenience can warm up and become devote. People can become devoted to each other, even if it's the money. We see here a, an incredible Antichrist. You really have to be very clever, very smart to bring this Antichrist. Antichrist is Romanian. Roman, but not Catholic. Romanian. He's very Italian in style. He's like uh, from a uh, uh, fashion magazine in Milano, very dashy, very charming. Antichrist is supposed to be charming, young, dashy, sexy, but uh, elegant, but he is not a Catholic per se. In fact, he was raised in the ex Soviet bloc. He comes from the ex Soviet bloc. Don't trust those people. Um, I'm reading a book. He is technically a Romanian Orthodox, not a Catholic, but he's Romanian, Roman. That's very smart. Catholics can read the book and enjoy it. Jews can read the book and enjoy it. Uh, Protestants can read the book and enjoy it. And how many Romanian, ex-Soviet, raised in, Rom in Soviet Romania, Orthodox do you have who might read the book? Don't lose a lot of readership. Now, one of the things that I find fascinating is the in-between cultures that were created between evangelicals and Jews. They started already in the 18th century. Jews, evangelicals write for the Jews. They write Jewish books in appearance. They try to convince the Jews in their own languages, in their own terms, they hired Jews at times, or people who studied Hebrew well. They teach Hebrew in their institutions. They teach Yiddish in the institution. Did you know that the first institutions of higher learning to teach Yiddish were not Jewish institutions of higher learning? There were none until the 20th century, 19th century. Uh, and, and those who were in the 19th century were in the German-speaking world, and they would not teach Yiddish even if you pointed a gun at them. Uh, the first institutions of higher learning to teach Yiddish were, of course, pietist and evangelical institutions, such as the University of Halle, because they wanted to prepare missionaries for the Jews. The first university courses, what we could call Judaic studies, were not in secular universities or in liberal Christian universities. They were actually in conservative Christian universities, unknown fact. Those people create literatures that were amazing historically. They try to persuade the Protestant community that Jews are important people, that they are, in with all their faults, with all the misled roots, they are positive beings that you should invest, invest time and resources and love for them, pray for them, contribute money for them, help the, the poor ones among them elevate their status. Pietists are among the very first to visit Jewish communities, then evangelicals, and come up and say, you know, we thought the Jews are all rich. In fact, most of them are poor. We're talking about East Central and Eastern Europe of the 18th century. 19th century Jews, immigrant Jews, or early 20th century immigrant Jews, including in America, those are poor people in need of material help, in need of education, in need of medical resources. The Jewish community then needs to compete with those missionary infrastructures. And we get, already in the 18th century, certainly the 19th century, communities of people are in between. Perhaps in front of rabbis here, it's the wrong place to tell you that some Jews who convert to Christianity, many of them don't stop being Jewish as far as they're concerned. They see themselves as intermediaries between the two cultures, between the two faiths. We find things that previously were unheard of. Now, Jews usually don't accept those in-between communities, those in-between uh, cultures. But the amazing thing is, and most Christians throughout history, when Christians asked Jews to convert, they wanted Jews to prove that they converted. In fact, they were suspicious of Jewish converts even after they converted. Now, you see within the center of evangelical Christianity, communities of what we can call evangelical Jews. There's no other way of describing it. 
There are a few hundred such communities in America of people. Uh, people often think about Messianic Jews as Jews who converted, became Christian, but they still claim to be Jewish. Demographically, for decades now, most Messianic Jewish communities are composed of people who were not raised Jewish. Either they had a Jewish parent or ancestry, or they married a Jew, or they just joined in. But my provocative claim here in the synagogue is that if you join an evangelical community, and you're born again in Christ, and you trust the Lord, you speak about being a believer, by which you mean a believer in Jesus, and you speak about sharing, by which you mean sharing the faith in Jesus, but you go to a congregation that meets on Friday evening or Saturday morning that uses a Jewish prayer book designed to bring Jesus into it. Some prayers are replaced, some places, prayers are not replaced to include Jesus. You use Hebrew words, including for Jesus, who's not Jesus anymore, but Yeshua. You sing Israeli songs, you dance Israeli dances. I'm not talking here about the importance of... I'm not saying that Israel is an indication, but I think that this is an indication of the license that the evangelical community at large gives those people who wish to combine Jewish identity and culture with evangelical faith. And those people serve Jewish food bagel and lox, hummus, uh, which is Arab but became Jewish, or falafel. Uh, they take tours to Israel. They pray for Israel. They pray for the Jewish people. They join Jewish causes as they see them throughout the last decade. Some of us already forgot about the struggle to free Soviet Jews or to help them immigrate to Israel. Those people uh, teach, teach their congregate, most of whom, overwhelming majority of whom not raised Jewish, teach them about the Jews and their role in history. Preach against anti-Semitism. Yes, pray for sharing with the Jews, etc. That people who stay in those congregations and celebrate the Sabbath on Saturday, celebrate the Jewish holidays, have a sanctuary that looks like Jewish sanctuaries with various Jewish paraphernalia and symbols, including the Ark, incidentally, with marginal reading of the Torah every week, with Jewish chanting, that those people, in effect, even if the Jewish community doesn't recognize them to be normative, mainstream Jews, those people, in effect, are Jewish, even if they are at the same time evangelical Christians. And that we do have here something that Christianity did not allow in such an open, wholehearted way until a generation ago. Evangelical Christians did not join, as a rule, as a rule, I hear that there are some corrections, as a rule, did not join, certainly not in the 19th century and not until marginally, perhaps today, hesitantly, partially, did not join interfaith dialogue. Because interfaith dialogue means you recognize the legitimacy of other faith. We come to the dialogue as equals, even if we don't think we are, the others are equal. Uh, we come to the dialogue assuming that we're equal. That's the, the basic assumption. We come to the dialogue willing to listen to each other, to respect each other. Dialogue means respect to the other. Evangelicals tell us that's misleading, that's unfair. Those people have to accept Jesus. But, but at the same time, those people are, conversa are in conversation with the Jews. Their theologies did change along the last decades 
in conversation with Jews. A good example was, let's bring that back, left behind. Those people don't recognize, theoretically, they don't recognize the intrinsic merit of the Jewish religion. But in effect, they do so more and more and more. If you examine Messianic congregations, you would see that the latest trend, and in, indirectly it's a larger evangelical trend, is to accept more and more post-biblical rabbinical Judaism. The, estate, the claim is Luther and Calvin are not relevant for us. Jesus is relevant, but not Luther and Calvin. The people, or, or for that matter, Karl Barth. If we need to go back to the sources, we can use the Mishnah. There's a whole movement called Hashizenu, like of that sort, within uh, Messianic Judaism. But it is more than that. If you look at evangelical Christians, thousands of churches, this is true also about many liberal churches, thousands of conservative churches, churches are now celebrating Passover in a Jewish-like celebration. That's a new, a new development. You can find evangelical, not Jewish evangelical, evangelical groups, it's on the margin, it's true, a few hundreds of them, who choose Jewish names, Hebrew names, but not he well-rooted like Emmanuel, but um, way, names that would give you at first impression, this is true in Chapel Hill, that this is a Jewish congregation. Um, so this, the house, the house of, uh, not the house, in Hebrew, the house of Jehovah, but not in, it's in its Hebrew pronunciation. We're back with Haggai. We're back with Haggai celebrating in Jerusalem a multinational celebration, but mostly you can see American and Israeli flag, flags. And we can see now this new attitude. John Hagee is also a novelty, not the only one. This is true about the International Christian Embassy. He refrains, in principle, from missionizing Jews in order to be accepted by Israeli leadership and public. Many evangelical Christians criticize him. He declares his respect to Israel and the Jewish people. But in effect, this is really uh, an alliance between right-wing American evangelicals and right-wing Israelis over many agendas, the settlements, the territories, the temple, even about, about Israeli internal character. We see it's something that also looks really that the messianic times have arrived. Christians and Jews are like two groups of sheep, uh, lambs, lambs and sheep, that, that's the way uh, many see that. Here we have evangelical volunteers in homes of Jewish settl settlers in Samaria. The one person here in the uh, picture that is a uh, settler is the young, is the young uh, baby. You can see this group is enjoying, it, enjoying itself in a table that is in uh, the settler's home. You would not see such pictures even half a century ago. And both groups accept each other for what they are. Settlers write in their journals, those Christians are better than many Jews. They accept our stand here in Judea and Samaria, known as the West Bank, because unlike liberal Jews, this brings us back to various evangelicals too, they don't have those inhibitions. They don't have those complex uh, liberal personalities in which you have to accommodate to progressive values. They know we belong here. They know we're here uh, on the basis of the Bible. And in some ways, we can understand them and they can understand us. Here we see Clint Eastwood. Well, not quite. Uh, but uh, I hope people are not too old to remember the good old movies of Clint Eastwood. Um, but those are volunteers. And pay attention to something here that's quite, again, the irony of the situation. Those people 
Samaria is now known for its wineries, for uh, its grapes and its wineries. Here are conservative evangelical volunteers, some of them Pentecostal or charismatic, or members of various Bible churches, volunteering to help Jewish settlers in Samaria, Orthodox Jews, to grow grapes, to pick grapes, and send them to the wineries. They would not do the same in Napa Valley. I already mentioned that not evangelicals are premillennialist, messianically oriented, dispensationalist, pro-Zionist. Here are progressive evangelicals who are friends with progressive Jews. Here is a gentleman who writes for Tikkun magazine, this horrible liberal journal whom conservative evangelicals don't even read. And he tells you that Jesus was a radical, that Jesus was a social reformer. He stands for political justice. He's a pro-Palestinian. Here we have a Bible college in Bethlehem, which is actually does not exactly represent conservative evangelicalism, but a new trend perhaps in conservative evangelicalism, particularly embraced incidentally by reformed the reformed uh, elements within progressive evangel within within evangelicalism which has removed itself from Jewish-Israeli causes, which is not Zionist anymore, pro-Israeli, and is standing, in spite of the fact that many Christians in Israel and the West Bank are not necessarily, don't necessarily stand for the Palestinian uh, cause anymore because it became increasingly more Muslim, sometimes radically Muslim, we also have those Christians, particularly members of the uh, leadership of the elite that uh, stand on the Palesti for the Palestinian cause and criticize Israel. Here we see a very harsh picture. This is not easy to watch if you're an Israeli or you're pro-Israeli. Christ at the checkpoint, which was organized just a year uh, and a half ago and invited Christians to support, if you will, on a Christian theological basis, uh, opposition to Israeli policies. And this is organized in Bethlehem Bible College, which is an evang evangelical uh, institution run by a Palestinian Lutheran evangelical uh, minister, Mitri Rehab, who comes from an orthodox Greek family, Christian Arab. And with this I end, I've left many, many lacunas. I did not speak about everything. I'm sure there were moments in which I steered questions, if not uh, objections. And instead of throwing rotten eggs at me, uh, I think what you can do is just ask questions or state opinions or make uh, what you would consider to be corrections. So I'm standing at O, uh, hoping to hear you. Thank you. Yeah, and please introduce yourself. So, um, although I probably won't remember your name for perpetuity, but I uh, will at least know who is who. Is who. Okay, I'm Dave Bennett from Des Moines. Shout. Sure. I'm David Bennett from Des Moines, and my question is event, evangelicalism is becoming increasingly international, not just American, not just Western. Is, are these same traits evidencing themselves in other parts of the evangelical world, say Africa or Asia or Latin America? Excellent. Thank you for going global, because that's what we all are doing, willy-nilly. Uh, evangelicalism is an international movement with hundreds of millions of adherents, particularly on the Pentecostal charismatic side outside of the United States. It has made tens of millions of converts in Latin America in the last half century. It has made millions of converts in Korea, in certain parts of Africa. Uh, 
Thank you, thank you. This is very important. It differs from one country to the other. Evangelical, evangelical Christians in England, evangelical uh, Church of England members, and this is the largest, the most vital, not the, they don't run the church, but they are the most, they have the largest numbers. They bring the crowds. In England, evangelicals are not pro-Israeli. Clearly. In Latin America, for example, uh, moving, moving into the evangelical orbit meant those are very often ex or defunct or renegade Catholics or people who grew up not very, very much devoted. But uh, this is a new, a new trend that brings over millions and millions of people particularly in, in urban centers, particularly the down and out. It has many, many uh, uh, social and political ramifications. In some ways, you can say that even evangelicalism in, certain, in some parts is actually uh, removes people away from radical political views. But uh, it usually makes people much more open and warmer towards Israel. And it is a fact that in the last few decades, each year now, hundreds of thousands of Latin Americans come to Israel as evangelical pilgrims. Most tourism to Israel, incidentally, in the last three decades is of evangelical Christians. And a large part of it is not necessarily from the United States, but even more so from Latin America. So this is one indication, a huge indication. Many people who previously had no particular a warmth to Jews or Israel now do show that kind of attitudes. You can see that at, at times in other parts of the world. But as I said, you, you have to check the context in each and every country. But thank you. This is a terrific question. And I should really stand corrected, humbled, corrected. I was really pointing to American evangelicalism, a little bit British, historically German and British. but Evangelicalism today is even, the numbers are even larger outside of the United States. And in some ways, the more vital forces are acting globally. So thank you very, very much. This was wonderful. I always like to stand corrected and to enlarge if I can. Yes? I'm Harry Hendrickson. I, I would really like to know how has that affected the relationship here? Okay, excellent, excellent. Uh, the question by Mr. or Reverend or Dr. Hendricks is, how did that affect day-to-day -day interaction between Jews and evangelicals? If you ask, had asked me that question uh, 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, I would say evangelicals and Jews don't so much see each other because Jews live mostly in the northeastern or midwestern centers where they meet more Catholics or Lutherans or Presbyterians, USA Presbyterians, Presbyterian Church USA, then they meet Southern Baptists or Pentecostals or Bible church goers and so on and so forth. Uh, the Jews have moved more to the Bible Belt, more to uh, areas that previously, they, they, have, they have nowadays evangelical na neighbors. And, but I think that on the whole, if you look at the developments in the last 50 years, Jews and evangelicals have much more warmed up to each other. But the question is, on the political or ideological level, it depends which Jews. Um, Eric Joffrey, the, uh, Joffrey, the uh, past leader of the reform movement, visited Liberty University. But he, this did not stop him from criticizing evangelicals and telling Jews don't associate with evangelicals because they represent conservative, reactionary uh, elements in American society, and we Jews are progressives. Uh, Rabbi Daniel Lapin from uh, Seattle, I believe, an uh, Orthodox rabbi, uh, head of Torah's tradition, says, the reason we are friends with evangelicals is not only because they support Israel. It's nice, it's good, it's important, but we just share their values. We also believe in prayer. We also don't like abortions. 
We also uh, don't like the gays. Certainly, we don't like gay marriages. Uh, we should embrace the evangelicals. We share, we share the same program. So the Jewish community as a community is very often divided over evangelicals. Uh, Right-wing Jews support, embrace evangelicals. The irony here is that Orthodox Jews are first and foremost the, the friends of evangelicals, and evangelicals are friends of, of, of uh, right-wing Jews. Evangelicals support the secularism movement. Evangelical finance uh, the Jewish temple buildings would be temple buildings. And those Jews know that and, and accept that this kind of court, courtship. Uh, the, if you look at the agenda of the first, one of the largest group of would be temple builders, they changed their name from the Temple Mount Faithful to Land of Israel and Temple Mount Faithful. Their first website, it's about a decade old, the first website wasn't in Hebrew, although it's a totally Israeli Hebrew uh, group. Their first website was in English, so that their evangelical friends can watch and contribute. Uh, and their leader, their founding leader, a Jerusalemite lawyer, uh, who, who for decades now is friends with charismatic Christians, uh, has, start, has started having visions. So you can see here an exchange that is very, very interesting. Those, in some ways, you can say that certain kinds of evangelicals became friends with certain kinds of Jews, where certain kinds of Jews are not particularly enthusiastic, and now there's also certain kinds of evangelicals that are not particularly enthusiastic. If you want to remove the evangelical community away from messianic thinking, it's not the reformed element, make up about 30% of the community in America, are trying to do, you also oppose the evangelical Israeli menage. Yes? Steve Weiss, I have a question about evangelicals who support Israel from the boundaries of Israel. I'm assuming it's important that Jerusalem be part of Israel, but in general, in the particular boundaries of Israel, is that a matter of Su Superb, superb. So just everybody heard the question? Great. You have terrific ears. <clears throat> this is a superb uh, question because when Israel evacuated Gaza, the Gaza Strip, evangelicals were not happy. Those, those evangelicals I was mostly talking about, conservative, messianic theory, they were not happy about it. They thought Israel, Israel was naive. But they didn't bother them very much either. Because you're right, the most important thing are the historical parts of Jerusalem. If Israel returns the Temple now, it will have a very strong effect on the evangelical mind and its understanding of the role of Israel. But giving back the Gaza Strip, so, so the Israelis are somewhat naive and they took the wrong step uh, from a hard line point of view, but it doesn't bother the, the, the prophetic map. Yes, Rabbi. Yeah, there, there, there are different points of view among the evangelicals. Some of them uh, we had a speaker here who came and basically said that God gave all Israel to the Jews and the Jews can't give it back without uh, sinning against God and therefore any compromise is a violation of God's will and that was the end of that. And this I is what Van der Hooven, and just to repeat, uh, 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 Jan Willem Van der Hooven, this great leader of the Christian Embassy, which is one of the two largest groups supporting Israel, even collecting money by the hundreds of millions, uh, for the Israeli needy, for Israeli settlers, for Israeli immigrants, he said that if the Jews give up on Jerusalem, it will be the second time that the Jews rejected Jesus. And I, uh, I spoke at that and said that's not what that the leadership, this was with Christians United for Israel program, and I know that that wasn't their point of view because I had talked to Christians before about that. So we, we talked earlier about um, this idea that, that organizations that are going to represent very large numbers of people need to have perspectives that are not, at least from my perspective as a reformed rabbi, I don't want the only perspective they have coming from orthodox right-wing conservatives. And so making sure that these organizations understand that if they want to interact with the mainstream Jewish community, they need to have a broader point of view uh, than that. 
and, and so uh, I reach out to their leaders and say, this perspective isn't good. You're not going to get as much support as you do. And their, their perspective, basically, their official perspective is to support Israel and what Israel believes it needs to do. Yes, but again, I, I'm, I, I raise the fact... I raise the point that what will happen, I've heard that from evangelical leaders, you know, we love, we love Israel, we, we, uh, Christian Zionism means, uh, you know, following in bless, you know, God blesses those people that bless the Jews based on, um, based on God's saying to Abraham, uh, and they mentioned that, but I raised the, the I raise a question: What will happen if the Jews give up on the Temple Mount? Now, Jerusalem is a no-go. Right, sure. because if that happens, this will change. Just based on the fact that uh, it's it's like again going back to the marriage of convenience. So it's the money, stupid, right? Uh, the same is true. It's a fact that sixty-seven transformed evangelical attitudes and made them much more intensive much more central to evangelical agenda. What happens if Jerusalem, if the Jews give up on East Jerusalem? That would be an issue. Even if they tell you that we, at this point, we just love and protect and care and are concerned and hope and wish the best. That's my, my, my suspicion is this is going to be a major turning point. At the same time, I think that you are right that the a rhetoric in the last decade very clearly became the rhetoric not just of messianic perspective for those who support Israel and care about and, and invest in the Jews, but the perspective that a good Christian should be, should be supportive of, of the Jews or protective of the Jews or respectful of the Jews. Um, okay, we'll, we'll have two of you. Will be converted before the end times, before the, yeah. And if that's the case, what would the role of other Republicans be? Because they're the ones who are going to be taking the other Jews. Is it just merely their presence, or would they have an active role in what would that be in the end times? Right, the second question I already answered, but I will answer again. I think I mentioned that the idea is the Jews, the Jews en masse are not converted to Christianity. They're not born-again Christians. This means they will stay here when the rapture takes place. And when that happens, we mentioned that, 144,000 will instantly convert. This would probably include myself because those are the 144,000 who heard the Christian evangelical message and messianic predictions see that they came true, the rapture took place, and so they convert immediately, and they try to convince other Jews and non-Jews in the truth of the Christian evangelical message. Those Jews who stay, who go through those years in between the current era and the next, the next being the kingdom of God on earth, those who don't perish in all the plagues and wars and murderous regimes, about a third of the Jewish people, throughout those years they will become convinced Christians. In fact, here's the good news. When Jesus comes back, they will cheer. They will cheer for him. They will call, uh, you know, the, the, the way that Hosanna to, for, to the son, for the son of David. They will recognize Jesus. They will congratulate Jesus. Even during the thousand years reign of Jesus on earth, which is not the eternal times, 
to a thousand years, in between era also, uh, the Jews will become the evangelists and educators of the new era of those thousand years. They'll all have terrific jobs in Jesus' kingdom on earth. They will be, they are Jesus' brethren and sisters. And uh, they will become part of the global governing, spiritual governing of Jesus on earth, of the righteous, that righteous kingdom. Uh, but this is a third of the Jewish people. Two thirds will perish, and since they did not convert and accept the Jesus before the rapture, they are doomed. So this was the, the second question. The first, your first question was about John Calvin, which for me is a turning point in Protestant attitude towards Jews. Not significant particularly during Calvin's lifetime, but would become significant along the ages. Until John Calvin, those people who spoke in similar terms to the way many evangelicals have spoken in the 20th century, those people who recognized the Jews to be biblical Israel, to recognize the Jews to be the covenant nation, were usually, or not even usually, they were on the radical margins of Christianity outside the mainstream. You see a lot of that. If you open a book about the Radical Reformation, which is dozens of groups, uh, you will find so many of them who spoke in very similar terms about the Jews, their, their national rejuvenation, their return to Palestine, the importance for end-time scenarios. But those were not influential ideas. Those people were crushed. They were physically murdered by the tens of thousands during the 16th century. Comes John Calvin in the middle of the 16th century, 1550s, and he is at the center. He is not the ruler of, theologically, the ruler of Christianity. This is Lutheranism, and there's a reform tradition, and there are other reformers. But he writes about the Jews. They were not cast out permanently. In fact, he writes, what happened to the Jews can happen to Christians. They can lose it temporarily or permanently. He is a lawyer who is fascinated by the Old Testament. This is an irony, right? The Christians spoke all the time uh, antagonistically about the law, capital A, at L. Comes John Calvin and says, terrific. Look, there are Sabbath laws in the Old Testament. He doesn't mean he accepted all the laws. He accepted those laws that were convenient, that he wanted to promote. Um, no disrespect to Calvin, God forbid. Uh, he's one of my favorites. Uh, but here we have a major, major theologian in the midst of New Jerusalem, if you will, Geneva, who is promoting the Old Testament not just as, a pre, as, as, a pre, as, as the opening, a prelude, an opening statement towards the New Testament, but telling us those two Books stand together on equal terms, and the Old Testament is just as important and abiding and a source for building a Christian society. And speaks with in what you'd call biblical Old Testament imagery, using biblical Old Testament imagery, and is saying the Jews are still part of the bargain, even if the role is temporarily suspended. That's a breakthrough in Protestant Jewish relations. And that breakthrough will influence the Puritans in England and New England, big time. In some ways you can say the first Christian Zionists were the Puritans. This will affect, incidentally, Calvin adopts a covenant language to, to describe his own group, his own saints, which Puritans will pick and run away with. Uh, later on with the pietism in Lutheran countries, but promoting what I would call reformed ideas. So John Calvin is extremely, extremely central. Uh, and he, he got bad press. Everything that he has been blamed for, incidentally, in history, intolerance, this, that, 
You can blame any thinker or leader in 16th century Europe, but um, the kind of, uh, on many other levels, his thought, his breakthrough, not only towards the Jews, this should be celebrated and he should receive a lot of respect, including outside of quote-unquote Calvinist circles. There's always understanding that if you're a Calvinist, it means that you're one of those 19th century Presbyterians who take people to, uh, who, who, who promote a certain outlook that they claim to be Calvinist. But there is, of course, Calvinism, like every other idea, has, is dynamic and is uh, progressive in the sense that it progresses throughout the years. And in Calvin, we can see a new trend of thinking. That's my, my reading of it. I also like Luther, but in a different way and for different reasons. So I actually do like Luther and Calvin. Let's talk about those people who say, let's forget them, they're too old. Henry Cohen, um, do the evangelical Christians uh, believe that Jesus is the and whether or not the Jews should all really be in Israel, would they not like you because you've moved away um, to the States? What would, do they care? Well, so I'm, again, we're talking about conservative, messianically oriented evangelicals in America. They would tell you that I would return anyhow when the moment comes. Uh, or that's one way of looking. That, that, that they would have said that 100 years ago. Today they would tell there is already enough Jews. The idea is that the Jews are going to return to Palestine in unbelief before accepting Jesus. Establish a commonwealth there. The idea was that yes, all the Jews would congregate eventually in Palestine, particularly during the Messianic era. But I'm here in America, I don't think it interferes with the advancement of the ages. Particularly, I can be a useful evangelist after the rapture takes place, provided I'm alive. I'm taking a terrible risk. Uh, one yes. more. One more. Yeah. Oh, I forgot, I forgot about you. Are, are you? Me? Yes. Did you uh, want to? I'm Scott Berry. Uh, my question is kind of the question that I came here with. I've always found it troubling that there was such a relationship between Jews, who are by and large part of the intelligentsia, and people that I perceive as believing in nonsense and fairy tales, and I would, I would question if I were a Jewish leader, or certainly an Israeli Jewish leader, and I was observing the inanity and the vacuous statements that our presidential candidates are making that claim to be evangelicals, I would think I would be cringing and pulling in my horns as far as association. Do you see that at all? Okay, so you, uh, I've heard in different words from the Jewish left, statements to that effect. I, I don't share in them, in spite of the fact that I come from, I believe I hold to a very progressive worldview. I don't share in them because I have a lot of respect to evangelical Christians. I don't think they are, are not all made of one cloth. They're not all unsophisticated, uh, non-intelligent, anti-intellectuals, as was the stereotype of fundamentalists for long decades. Um, I have respect for what I would call the spiritual commitment of evangelicals. I have respect for the commitment for outreach of evangelicals. I think Jews can learn from them a few things. Um, and their openness and inclusiveness within the realm of faith in Jesus and the need to be born in Jesus and treat the Bible as authoritative. Their inclusiveness, their attempt to bring people of all backgrounds, ethnicities, uh, languages. I also have respect for the creativity and uh, the ability of evangelicals to reinvent themselves in every generation and in every corner of the earth. Uh, I don't treat evangelical Christians dismissively. Those, just those, as if it's one block one heard of anti-intelligentsia, anti anti-liberal thought. I also don't just judge the evangelicals just by the uh, rather narrow selection that we have now of 
candidate of presidential hopefuls on the Republican camp. Uh, I would like to recommend to you, perhaps in this respect, a book I did not write, uh, a bestseller, also an academic bestseller, uh, Randall Balmer, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory, I see a nod here of recognition and approval, which is really about uh, a person who was a professor at Columbia, he ran away from his life, uh, and uh, he visited like 30 different evangelical institutions, centers, groups, churches, just to show people like you uh, the richness and the variety of evangelical life and thought. And he mentions, incidentally, in the book, Israel and Evangelical Jews. Uh, I, I highly recommend the book because I think that your attitude, I, I respect you, I know where you're coming from, I think that this attitude that dismisses evangelicals is is not always, uh, I think, fair towards evangelicals. It's certainly not, not useful for an evangelical Jewish conversation to be based. If you want evangelicals to treat you respectfully and not just dismiss you as one of those secular humanists in New York who uh, worship the devil, uh, you need to treat them as not those dummies there, those reactionary dummies there, who uh, also worship the devil, but to treat them respectfully for what they have to offer. And one of the things they had to offer, I'll end with that, is a very rich and creative history of attitudes towards the Jews in the last three centuries. And for that, they also deserve respect. They also provided me with the field of research <laughs> for many years. And for that, they deserve a lot of thank you. Could you tell me the name of that book again? Randall Balmer, My Eyes Have Seen the Glory. If you were my student, you would have read it twice over. <laughs> he is the only Randall Balmer in the world. He might have, I need to be, yes? <laughs> well, you know, all the gifted, all the gifted, creative people come from Des Moines, Iowa. I have to, I have to offer you that. Uh, so, uh, There's one more very, I didn't know that, but you see, Dee, so Des Moines, Iowa can be very proud of another bright child. Uh, Yes, Jews for Jesus is one group. I showed a book written by the former director and his wife, a legendary figure by the name of Moish Rosen. Uh, if there ever was a smart, clever Jewish boy, it was him, father of Jews for Jesus. Uh, this is one group among many, many that are there to represent evangelical values and faith and bring it to the Jews. It's not synonymous with uh, Messianic Judaism. In fact, it's, it was an enemy of Messianic Judaism. Because Moshe actually wanted his converts to join regular churches. So many people, read, many people use Jews for Jesus synonymous with Messianic Judaism, but it is not synonymous. He deserves, again, a lot of respect for building what became one of the largest missions on Earth in resources and manpower, and very creative in its, uh, in its uh, language, publications, and uh, means of approaching people. Most of its converts are not Jewish. Most of the converts it makes are not Jewish. Uh, but it's, it's just one group among the many. It's interesting, it's such a, it was such a powerful group that it gave the name for the entire relationship between evangelicals and Jews as far as attempted conversions and building in between communities and territories are concerned.
Please join me in thanking Dr. Thank you.